Hi, reader. I'm Cindy Burnett. Welcome to my award-winning podcast, Thoughts from a Page, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. On the show, I chat with authors whose books I have enjoyed about their new releases, and I give you a peek behind the curtain of the publishing industry with my Behind the Scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. If you're looking for a community of readers, bonus content, and a chance to read books before they hit the shelves, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group, which is filled with a wonderful bunch of book lovers. The link to join is in the show notes. Do you love to be in the know about upcoming books? Kelly Hooker of At Kelly Hook Reads Books and I do too. We couldn't find a comprehensive list of titles all in one place, so we made one ourselves, and now we're sharing it with you. Our literary lookbook is a list of 182 books releasing from January to May 2024, curated for our communities. The link to buy it is in my show notes. Today, I am chatting with Amy Pease about her debut, Northwoods. I read Northwoods a while ago and absolutely fell in love with the characters and the story. It is a very well plotted mystery that is the start of a series and deals with some timely issues that we are all seeing across the country. Amy is an alumnus of the University of Wisconsin and the Madison Writer Studio and works as a nurse practitioner where she is a nationally recognized HIV specialist. She lives in Wisconsin with her husband and two children. Northwoods is her first novel. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Amy. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm great as well. And I'm so excited to chat with you because I read your book months ago and loved it. And I have been shouting it out everywhere I can. Yes, I've seen that. I really appreciate that. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Absolutely. Your publicist gets the best books. So anytime she sends me an email, I am really careful to look at the book and pay attention because I feel like her recommendations are always spot on. Yeah, she's incredible. I'm really lucky to have Holly. You really are lucky to have Holly. She's fabulous. And I told her after I read your book, I wanted to do it for one of my traveling galleys, which is this program I have for my Lit Lovers Patreon group, where we start with four or five galleys and then we mail them on to the next person. And it has been so popular with that group. Every single person that has read it has been glowing about it, posting about it. So I was happy to see that. Well, why don't you give me a quick synopsis of Northwoods and then we'll dive into my questions. Sure. So Northwoods is set in modern day Wisconsin in a fictionalized version of a northern resort town. Um, And it's the height of summer. And the book opens where we meet Eli North, who is a deputy with the small town county sheriff's department. And he gets a dispatch call to investigate a noise disturbance. And when he gets there, It's a a lakeside cabin, and he comes across the body of a teenage boy in a boat uh, at the dock. And so the investigation begins. We quickly learn that the boy's friend who was with him that day has gone missing, and the FBI then gets involved. The book follows the mystery, but also spends a lot of time focused on Eli and his struggles with PTSD and alcohol abuse because he's a he's a former investigator with the US Fish and Wildlife Service but he also is a veteran of the war in Afghanistan 
and he's really struggling. We meet him when he's at the very end of his rope. He is really struggling. And that's one of the things I want to talk about in a little bit. But before we do that, this is your debut. What made you decide to write a mystery? You know, the mystery just decided it wanted to be written. So I don't tend to reach for mystery thrillers as much as I know a lot of people do. But the way that I came up with the idea for this book is I was just bored when I was on my commute to work. And I challenged myself to just come up with an image, any image that just popped into my mind. And it was the opening scene of the book um, where Eli is, it's late at night. It is him floating in the lake, a melancholy mood, and suddenly some music comes drifting across the lake. And it was at last by Etta James. Like it was so vividly that song to the point where I included the first four lines of the song in the opening chapter. And I had to go through quite a lot um, of hoops to get the rights to play, to, to include those first four lines. But I just let that scene develop into another scene and then another scene. And eventually it just was clearly a murder mystery. So have you always wanted to write a book or you developed all of this in your head and thought, okay, I think I'll write a book? I've always very abstractly wanted to write a book. And I think it goes back to when I was, you know, in elementary school and I read Anne of Green Gables. Not only did I like that book, but the main character it becomes an author. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. Now, I didn't do anything about that for about 30 years because um, Northwoods is the first thing I've ever written. But I knew someday, or at least maybe at, along the way, I hoped someday. But then I got this idea for a book and decided that this was the idea that I was going to move forward with. That's very impressive that this is your first attempt. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about Etta James and getting approval to use the first four lines of At Last. Yeah. So like I said, that song was so vivid in my imagination that I had to get it. And my agent and my editor were just like, okay, good luck with that. So I, it took me months to figure out who to even contact. And then I would email who I thought would be the person to talk to. And a month later, they'd email me to say, actually, it's this other person. And that happened two or three times more until finally I figured out who it was I needed to talk to. And then at that point, it was just like a couple pages of paperwork. And, you know, I think the rights were less expensive than I thought. I thought I'd get to that point and it would be prohibitively expensive. And I want to say it was like $500. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to do it. It means that much to me. And my sweet editor was like, mm -hmm, yep, whatever you want. <laughs> they're probably like, uh, I'm not sure anyone else cares about this, but go for it. Exactly. And it wasn't going to impact anything they were doing. That's pretty funny. And I'm sure after you'd spent all that time, you're like, $500 is just not that big a deal. No, nope. It was worth it to me. So a huge focus of the book is addiction. Eli is really struggling. At least one other character is really struggling. Why did you decide to make that a focus? Well, the character of Eli sprang from my imagination fully formed. So I don't know why. I don't know if he's been living in my mind for a long time, but I knew exactly who he was and I knew that he was struggling with something. And I've been a healthcare provider for 20 years. So mental illness and mental health concerns and addiction are something that I have a lot of insight into, you know, for the most part, secondhand. But if somebody is in as much pain as I knew Eli was in, it's it's going to be mental health related. And it just somehow fit that he was a veteran and this was PTSD. I felt that you depicted addiction so vividly, but also compassionately. And that explains it if you're a healthcare provider, because I read the book, I passed it to my husband. And as I mentioned, a variety of the lit lovers have read it. And everyone comments on how well and how accurately you depict addiction. And I was kind of curious where that came from, but I think it makes sense if you're a healthcare provider. Yeah. I know that some readers are, you know, feel like it's it's very dark. And it is, although I would say that at no point is it bleak because there's always a shot at redemption. There's, you know, I think everybody pretty much has redeeming characteristics, even if they're in real bad shape, like somebody like Eli is. And 
Compassion is really necessary when you're a healthcare provider because sometimes you have to deal with folks who are just really, you know, not easy to deal with. And the only way you can provide care is if you open up your compassion and try to understand what their story, their life story is, and understand why they make the decisions they do, why they, you know, act the way they do. So it was easy to translate that into very nuanced characters, even though those characters had some pretty significant flaws. That's interesting that readers have thought it was dark. I don't like to read very dark at all. I mean, I am kind of in the middle of the road, not too light, not too dark. And I felt that it was sad at times, but I felt it was accurate. And I felt like it's a super timely topic. I mean, drug addiction is obviously very prevalent these days. It's something that everyone is struggling with in the United States. I mean, every state seems to be having issues with it and a variety of people are. And so I just felt it was timely and it was interesting because you portrayed Eli in a way that it was difficult to read about him, but then I really felt for him as well. And I think that is the problem with addiction. Sometimes it's hard to get into the mind of people. And if you're not an addictive personality or you don't have this type of addiction, you think, what is going on? Why can't they just kick it? And I think that you portrayed that so well as to why he couldn't kick it. Yeah. At the end of the day, mental health issues and addiction are medical conditions. And there's a part in the book where Marge, who's not only the sheriff, so Eli's boss, um, she's also his mother. She's sort of out loud finally saying, you know, I understand that you're going through something very difficult. I thought that loving you was enough to help you. And I realized that it's not enough. And professionals need to help you. People who know how addiction and mental health concerns work and what to do to help. And I agree that the PTSD factors in as well. But I feel like PTSD has been dealt with in a number of books. And I understand that's what causes Eli's problem. But I just haven't really read about addiction in the way I did in your book. And so that just really stood out to me. And I bet that's the reason other readers are commenting on it as well. Yeah. And I know that some, every once in a while, there's, you know, because I think the wounded warrior trope is very commonly used, including in crime fiction. Definitely. And I would say, you know, as a healthcare provider, yes, it's a trope, but it's also reality. So what I made Eli go through is something that many, many people go through in real life. So it wasn't that that's the benefit of coming from a healthcare background, too, is that I know what is stereotype and what is reality. And I think that's why it's resonating so well, because it felt so authentic. Mm -hmm. Knowing that this is a start to a series, did you really keep that in mind while you were drafting Northwoods in terms of not boxing yourself in for different things for future books? Yes, that has been a big challenge. It's been, you know, to have an arc, a story arc and a character arc within one book, but then also have room to create a an arc for a series, you know, especially since I don't really have experience writing. I didn't write anything before this. It's been something that's on my mind a lot. Did you map out more than one book to, to sort of have a plan or did you just write this one trying to make sure you didn't box yourself in and then keep going? I would say unofficially, I've tried to sort of come up with the main topics of the subsequent books and, you know, what things I can reveal, you know, if there's like um, an ultimate bad guy, who is that ultimate bad guy? And how do I gradually reveal who that is throughout the course of the series? I always think that's fascinating. And I love asking authors this question because often, especially if they're down the road in books, they'll be like, I so wish I hadn't included this one detail in my first book that now I can't get away from, or I have to totally revise it, or I have to revamp it. And it's just interesting if you're at the beginning to think through, okay, how do I not want to lock myself into things that I'll later wish I hadn't done? Yeah, that's funny because I finished the manuscript and was in like uh, final wrap up edits when I was like finishing up the first draft of the second book. And I would keep on emailing my editor and be like, oh, there's this one tiny detail that can we please change? Is it too late to change? Because it would affect what I can do in the second book. Um, And she was so, so flexible and kind and, and would always somehow make it work. 
Well, and that's the beauty of writing the second one while the first one is in the final edits because you can make those changes. Yeah. Well, what kind of research did you do? The only research that I really did was, first of all, if there were some sort of like police procedural things that I didn't know, because I don't know any of that. That's all coming from what I've seen on TV and read in other books. Um, But there's a Facebook group called Cops and Writers that I would tap every now and then if there was a question, mostly things like, you know, would the FBI get involved in a situation like this? And then I also did a little bit of research into the geography and the landscape and the culture of Eastern Afghanistan, like mountainous Eastern Afghanistan. So I'm dying to hear about this Facebook group, Cops and Writers. What happens in there? Uh, People like me can say, you know, can ask questions like, how quickly would realistically a forensics report come back? And then there are some great moderators and other people in the group who have a lot of personal experience, you know, who are law enforcement or former law enforcement or, you know, even like defense attorneys and things like that um, can chime in. And it's so helpful. In fact, I met one of my beta readers from that group is um, a public defender, not not in Wisconsin. I've never actually met him, but he, we swapped uh, manuscripts for a beta read. So it was invaluable. So do you just go down all sorts of rabbit holes? I think what would happen to me is I would start reading everybody else's questions and all of the answers. And an hour later, I'd be like, oh, my gosh, I'm still reading everything in this Facebook group. Oh, yeah. I do that with anything. Any any little inkling of an idea, like I look up FBI case files to get ideas for you know, other, other real life things that happen that I can maybe fictionalize for the purposes of my story. Because yeah, fictionalizing stuff like that is a whole lot easier, certainly when you can, than completely concocting something in your mind, especially if you're like me and I have no law enforcement background. I'm totally intrigued with this group now. Yeah. So why did you choose a resort town in Wisconsin for your setting? Um, it just came to my mind. Like I said, that scene came to my mind. It That scene is actually at a, an actual lake near where um, my relatives have a cottage. And it's a it's called Moon Lake. And in my mind, that scene is exactly in Moon Lake where I have been and where I've swam, not in the middle of the night. But I also am intrigued by the history that that part of Wisconsin has when it comes to organized crime. So the like Chicago Prohibition gangsters made their vacation homes up there. And, you know, like the movie public enemies, there's a shootout between, I think it's John Dillinger and the FBI. And that's at a place called Little Bohemia that still exists. It's a little resort in Manaqua, which is kind of a fictionalized version. Shaky Lake is a fictionalized version of Manaqua. So it made a good setting for your story. Yeah, it just decided it wanted to be the setting. I love that. Well, what surprised you the most when you were writing this one? I would say that at least initially, I wrote, you know, as they say, uh, by the seat of my pants. So so you just write and see what comes out of your mind. And I was amazed many times at what just came out of my mind. So I'm trying to remember what exactly like a good example of that. So the second chapter of the book is when Eli goes to the cottage and searches the premises and then finds the boy. That was all I just wrote what came out of my mind, and that's what I ended up with. So writing a mystery is tricky. There's pacing issues that you have to worry about. There's revealing clues at the right time. Did you have to work a little bit on that? Did you get the whole thing down first and then go back and try to insert some of that? How did you handle that aspect? Oh, it was a mess. It was such a mess because I really like complex mysteries. And in this case, there are like seven, I think seven chapters that are from the perspective of a totally different person who is linked to the main plot. And I needed to weave that person's story together with Eli and Marge, and then have them connect at a certain point at like, um, you know, like a, a climax point. But especially since I sort of wrote by the seat of my pants, I, I almost wrote myself into corners many times. In fact, It was, I think, even in the copy edit stage. So this is like right before they start formatting the book and everything, where I was still like trying to really pin down the plot. So coming up with plots to me is the hard part. And I did my best to like 
stop in the middle of writing and try and get a handle on the outline and where things are going. So I didn't completely end up at a dead end, but it was really a challenge. And it's really a challenge writing the second book too. It has not gotten easier, unfortunately. I'm always so curious about that. And that's what authors say every time, even when they get to book seven and eight, that you're almost starting from scratch each time. Yes, it seems to be the case. Yes. What about the highlight of writing Northwoods? You know, the highlight for me was seeing it through to the end. And by which I mean, getting to the point where it felt done, done enough to start querying agents, because, you know, the whole way through, there's a lot of self-doubt. Like, will I ever finish this? Is this any good? Is this anything anybody would ever want to read? And the fact that I got it all done, even, you know, and then there's the added bonus of, of finding an agent and getting a, a publishing deal. I, I just, it was really maybe a surprise that I managed to see it through to the end. Sometimes people will say their highlight is writing the end, <laughs> which I understand. But yes, I think that's amazing. You're driving to work and you have this one idea. You can visualize it, but that you actually got it down and got the entire story down. That's pretty impressive. And I always say for anyone who's aspiring to be a writer, you have to really want it. You have to want it a lot because it's a lot of work. And, you know, I feel like I hear about writers who just like write, write for the fun of it. And that's awesome. That is not me. It is difficult. Like my day job is far easier than writing, but it's just something that means a lot to me. And I really, really wanted and I do still want going forward because it is hard. It is hard. And what I find interesting, and I don't think everybody necessarily understands that, is writing the book itself is incredibly difficult, but that doesn't end the process. The rest of it is also difficult, getting it published. Once it's published, finding readers, you know, it's an ongoing thing. And I think sometimes people think, oh, I got my book published, I'm done, but you're not done. Right. And I always, you know, years ago, I would always hear on blogs or, or whatever that the chance of getting a book published is like almost zero. And that was discouraging. I think that if you want it enough and you're willing to work hard enough, not only, you know, making sure that you have the skills to write, but putting in the work to get the book written, I, I think that your chances of getting published are there. You know, it's, I don't want anyone to feel discouraged or that it's an, an impossible thing to be a published author. But I think you do need a story that is somewhat unique or takes people in a different direction. And I think that helps a lot because if it's just the same story that 10 other people have written, I think it's more difficult. Right. And that's where being a very um, well-read person helps a lot. You know, you if you know that the story you have in mind has been done to death, then you're not going to write that story. You're going to find a way to give a different slant or write something different altogether. Exactly. And I think trends factor in. I know Reese Bowen has written historical fiction now set in World War II, but she started trying to sell it in the 2000s, early 2000s. And at the time, publishers were like, nobody's reading World War II. Now, of course, everybody's reading World War II. So I think some of it also depends on what publishers are looking for. Yeah. And I, it just so happened that the what I have a lot of knowledge about, the addiction and mental health stuff, I think, thankfully, has become more prevalent in books and TV shows. And the fact that I know about it on a probably deeper level than generally speaking I, I thought, well, I can add something that even though it's maybe has been talked about before, I think I can still make it worthwhile. Absolutely. That's what I was saying earlier, is that I feel like I haven't come across this before in fiction. There are all sorts of books coming out in the nonfiction arena regarding addiction. And so there aren't a lot I haven't found in this arena, especially in the mystery side, that have dealt with addiction like you are dealing with it. So I think that that probably was such a hook for publishers. Yeah, I wanted to humanize it because I think we all have stereotypes of what someone with addiction or mental health challenges looks like, what they sound like, what they act like. And I know that the stereotypes are often not true. You know, I made, I specifically made Eli a very strong, large, good looking person <laughs> because I didn't want to feed into a stereotype. In fact, he gets teased at one point for looking like a Disney prince. And I just, I wanted to, I wanted to show that the stereotypes aren't necessarily true. Exactly. And I think readers appreciate that. 
Well, I always love to talk about titles and covers. Your cover is beautiful. Tell me how you all decided on Northwoods for the title and then how your cover came about. Um, Northwoods was the title I gave it just right away. In fact, you know, like the very first draft is titled that in my computer. So I don't know. I, I don't have a good explanation for why that came to me, but it just was, it was just the name of it. And then the cover, I, I, I don't, so, okay. So the first cover that they gave me was very different than what I had in mind. And I emailed my agent in a panic to be like, I don't like it. What do I do? Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm trying not to freak out. And my agent is very, very chill. And she talked me down and then we chatted about what it was I was looking for. And what I ended up doing is sending my editor a photograph of, you know, a typical Northern Wisconsin view from a lake shore across a lake at sunset. And the um, cover design folks took the color scheme and took the, even the landscape, the vegetation, they took it and made it into the gorgeous cover. In fact, apparently they struggled because it kept on looking too pretty and not mysterious or ominous enough. So what did it look like originally? It was all blue tones. Like, yeah, it was very cool tones and all blue and white and gray. And the landscape was more like a marsh instead of what the Northwoods of Wisconsin looks like, which is rocky shores and pine trees and very wooded. And I didn't really know how to articulate what I didn't like about it. But thankfully, my agent also has a master's degree in art. So she was much better than I was at articulating what changes could be made. And providing a photo, I'm sure, helped as well. Oh, yes. So Northwoods, there has been a book this fall, Northwoods by Daniel Mason. That's interesting that two books coming out sort of close in time to each other with similar titles. Yes, I have not read that one yet. And I saw I didn't know it was going to come out till it came out. And it's, I, 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 it's definitely on my to-be-read list because it, it has gotten just amazing reviews. But I thought it was funny, though, because that version, that Northwoods is on two lines, North and then Woods on two different lines. And we actually struggled with the cover design for mine because Northwoods is sort of a long word to fit in one line on the cover of the book. And I said, well, if we want, we can split it into two lines. And I'm glad now that we didn't. Well, yes, and his is two words versus your one word, which I think mm -hmm. helps too. And I actually haven't read that book either, but I've heard it's phenomenal. So I want to read it as well. And I guess it probably helps two books with Northwood. Somebody looks it up and they see both. Exactly. Yeah. That cover is gorgeous. I, I, I had in mind, like what my initial thought was for the cover was something along the lines of a mid-century travel poster. And I don't know if you know kind of what I'm talking about, but there are more illustrations. And I have found some, you know, photo online of a cover of um, a mid-century travel poster to the North Woods. And I thought, well, that that's what I want. But then I, you know, learned and understood that there are certain ways that mystery covers kind of need to look you know, so that when someone looks at the book, they can say, oh, that's a mystery. That's right. I was just going to say covers really convey genres. And I don't know that I can necessarily envision what you're talking about with the mid-century posters. You're making me think of all of those national park posters that were done really a little earlier in the 1930s, Yellowstone and Yosemite. And they're, they're definitely illustrated. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yes, I think those are beautiful, but I definitely think that conveys an older story versus yours conveys a mystery. Right. So you and I are going to have a spoiler-filled conversation for my Lit Lovers group when we wrap this interview up. But before we wrap up, I would love to hear what you've read recently that you really liked. Sure. Well, hands down, my favorite book this year was Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. It deals with opioids a lot, too. I, you know, friends and family who've read it felt like it was very dark, but it was a, a bit like, like Northwood's to me, didn't feel dark. And in the same way, Demon Copperhead wasn't either. There was always, you knew that the arc was headed towards redemption. And every sentence of every paragraph from the beginning of that book, just the prose was amazing. You know, you're sucked in immediately. You feel like you're right there with the characters. So I really love that. And then a book that was very similar to Demon Copperhead actually was Don't Know Tough by Eli Craner. 
I thought that was amazing. Like I got goosebumps from the moment I started reading that book. So I'd recommend that too. Um, I don't read a lot of nonfiction, but I loved The Wager by David Grann, which I can see that a lot of people love that book. So that's about the like British ship that was shipwrecked back in the mid 18th century. It was really good. And then I really liked the book, The Paleontologist by Luke Dumas, which just came out, I think on Halloween. And it was, it's just a really unique plot. It's sort of um, a mystery horror mashup, but it's also really funny. So those are some of the books I've really enjoyed. Um, And then what I reach for most when I'm just looking for books to read for fun are actually romance, like historical romance, like, you know, bodice rippers, I guess you'd say. And my very favorite book in that was um, the, a book called The Spy Master's Lady by Joanna Bourne. And I believe it's the first book in a series called Spy Master Series. Um, and it's set like roughly a reign of terror, French Revolution, and it's spies. And it's just so well written and loved it. I've been seeing The Paleontologist and I've been curious about it because I'm not really a horror reader. How creepy is it? I'm not a horror reader either, but I would say that there, yeah, I I would give it a, I would give it a medium creep factor. Okay. So it's probably too much for me. No, it wasn't scary. It wasn't like watching a horror movie because I don't like, I don't like scary movies at all, but it was, it more had like themes and genre elements versus being actually scary. Okay. Because I've been very curious about it, but I don't want to read a book that keeps me from sleeping at night. Yeah, I told Luke that it was just crazy. It was it was totally crazy, but in the most creative and entertaining way. Okay, I'll have to ponder that one. Well, Amy, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been so interesting, and I'm thrilled we got to talk because, as I mentioned, I loved Northwoods, and it's fun to fill in some of the details. Oh, thanks so much for having me. This has been really fun. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Hello, and welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts from a Page. If you enjoy this show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts from a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. Science, science, science. Hello, podcast fans. Want to get weird with us? Come check out the Mad Scientist podcast. We are a weekly show that looks at the history, philosophy, and hard facts behind your biggest paranormal questions. Did the government really pay for a psychic spy program? Yes. Is it true that surgery got its start in grave robbing? Yes. Can a roller coaster really kill you? Legally, we can't say so for sure, but sometimes, yes! Join myself, Chris Cogswell, and my co-host, Marie Mayhew, as we examine the science, philosophy, and history behind the strange and unusual. All to discover what's possible and plausible versus what's, well, just made up. 
Check us out wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Mad Scientist Podcast. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not, it's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily.